All right, so feel free to comment on deer. We'll, we'll, we'll work a little bit through this. Um, just, just a little bit of background. Um, so this fits right into that deer do deer have social groups um, and they have a hierarchy. So if you, you know, if you see deer on your property, a lot of times it'll be a matriarchal dam and it'll be her offspring and her offspring spring typically. And, uh, and then the males, except during, and uh, their turkeys breed in the spring, deer breed in two weeks in November, or is the peak breeding season for deer in Maryland. Um, so the males will be in bachelor bands, except for, you know, the fall, and then they'll, they'll be fighting each other and, you know, and trying to, trying to breed as many females or as many whitetails as they can, or does as they can, sorry. Um, deer have a home range. So, you know, it's funny, I talk to a lot of people, a lot of people think deer are just kind of out there wandering across the land. One day they're here and the next day they're 20 miles down the road, and that's not the case. They have a home range, females, it's about one square mile. Um, and she very rarely will leave that square, that square mile. Males, it's a little larger for males, probably averages five miles, um, square miles, but during the breeding season, it could be 25 square miles. Um, they're trying to find as many receptive females as they can um, during that, generally late October, early November. Think of deer as being you know, nocturnal, typically they're a nocturnal species, um, although any more, um, their behavior has changed. I think more and more they become more acclimated to, to people and uh, you know, it's not uncommon to see them at any time during, during the day or night now. They're ruminants, um, so they do have to do that rumination process. So they're not up all night and, and bedded all day or vice versa. They'll, they'll bed for a little bit to let that rumination process work. Then they'll be up browsing some more. Then they'll be back down bedding some more. So this, this happens multiple times during, during a 24 hour period. Um, being ruminants, they eat a wide variety of, of, of material, you know, as far as natural vegetation goes, you know, um, uh, uh, poison ivy, you know, you know, just about any, anything that's green and native in your woods, they're going to, they're going to eat. Um, and then from a mask standpoint, like I said, oaks and acorns are very important, hickory. Um, and then what's that? Plant poison ivy, exactly. So, but but they really like poison ivy, um, and then unfortunately, they really like farmers' crops, um, and that's one of the things we deal with a lot. Is you know, is is corn and beans, um, especially. They really like farmers' crops, um, but no, no, yeah, green. They really like green bar. You know, green bar is a, a preferred species. Um, so. But, you know, so between the farmer's crops and then the other issue is, is, is they're browsers, they're not grazers. So, you know, a lot of people think, oh, they're out eating grass all the time. Well, they're not grazers, they're browsers. So they're eating seedlings, um, you know, they're eating the buds off your, off your understory trees, et cetera. So that can be a problem. Yep. Um, well, they prefer natives over invasives and exotic barberry and autobol and that kind of stuff but from a from an energy standpoint and you know they like crops they like corn and beans because it's, it's a lot of food and it's you know high energy and it's really easy to get but you're right technically it's, yeah and it's plant it's row yeah so it's, it's not yeah you're right it's not it's not a native wild species but but they really like it. Yeah. what is it like five pounds a day? I think I think it's like five pounds a day they, they consume, which, yeah, it's like a, one of the bigger, one of the bigger Ziploc bags, um, they a gallon maybe, a gallon Ziploc bag, you stuff it as full as you can with, with, with twig tips and that kind of stuff, and that's what they eat, every, that's what every one of them eats every day, so. Especially, not, um, and and lie, as far as Lyme disease goes, there's no concern with eating with eating the deer and like contracting Lyme disease. The only way you're going to contract Lyme disease is getting bit by a yeah. And there is no disease that we're aware of 
currently in Maryland that deer have that would that would impact. Now, we have diseases. But what I'm saying is there's none. That and then you go out obviously, but there hasn't been any diseases. CWD, chronic wasting disease. We have CWD in in Allegheny County, and uh, it, yeah, but it's expanded. So it, yeah, they found it in West Virginia first, and it's kind of spread. And it's it's in different places in the country. CWD would be the would be the one to be most concerned about because it is in the same family of diseases as mad cow. Um, it's a prion disease. It's not a it's not a virus. It's not a bacteria. It's actually a modified protein and. And when it accumulates, it basically accumulates in the base of the brain stem and causes your normal proteins to misfold and you get holes in the brain and you die eventually. <laughs> so mad cow is the, is the problem, is why we're concerned with CWD because mad cow is eating beef. Um, and since the first family, that's why we have, to, we have to be a little careful with CWD. But there's never been a case of of somebody eating a deer and then contracting CWD. Thing. It's also scrapey. Um, I don't know how many of you are farmers or deal with sheep, but, but scrapey in sheep is also one of these prion diseases. And scrapey has been around for hundreds of years. And and again, you know, there's no concern with you know with eating sheep and, and contracting scrapey. So, so when they're in a species, it seems like this disease stays typically stays in that species. Um, so the, the so you know the chance of somebody eating a deer that has the carrying CWD and then getting CWD is probably pretty slim. But we still like to put it out there, hey, you gotta be careful. Once it goes clinical, the deer will look sick. It'll be way it'll literally will be wasting away. Um, and you know, it'll have neurological issues, etc. But there's other there's other diseases, you know, that, that deer can get that have the same symptoms. Um, you know, it could even just, you know, and 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 then just be um, the same. Um, and the other thing is, is they carry CWD for two, three years or longer before it goes clinical. So they're out there carrying the disease, and you you have the only way you know by testing. We have we've 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 had eleven deer. We randomly test every year. Um, we roughly 300 samples from 100 killed deer in Allegheny County and get them tested. So we have positive now since 2010. None of those deer look sick. What has 100 and, they're up to 190 roughly positives. They've had it since, they found it in I think out of those 190 positives in West Virginia, I could count on one hand how many of them actually look sick. You know, the rest of them, the way they knew they were carrying the disease was laboratory test. Um, so, so CWD, yeah, I mean, that's, no, I mean, the only way to, the only way to, to detect the disease is off the lymph nodes and the brain stem, a lab, they, they actually section and stain and, and it's, it's, it's a lab process. That's it. They're trying to work on a live animal test, um, but it's, it's a ways away and it involves a tonsil swab and all kinds of well, it's for that they're developing that for the captive deer industry. Yeah, for, for the people that have deer, captive deer. Yeah, that's why they're trying to, to, to develop a live animal test. Yeah, it wouldn't work for <laughs> wouldn't work for us. <laughs> so yeah, but no, not to get off on a tangent, but yeah, that that that's the story on the diseases. But basically, so you know, if it's a sick looking don't eat it. Yeah, I mean we have plenty of deer, don't eat it. But but otherwise there's no concern. It's 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 healthy. Yeah, we have a disease management area set up in Allegheny County, and, and yeah, the whole work. Another question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and that's how that's how it spread. Yeah, it it, it spreads through through direct contact. Um, and yeah, you know, food food plots are probably a pretty low risk, but baiting. You know, truthfully, when you have a corn pile and you're attracting multiple deer, um, that could be a concern. Um, and we allow baiting. And I would love, I would love to not allow baiting, but politically, we will never, we'll never get to the point where we, where we don't bait. Um, so, yeah.
Well, yeah, it's cyclic based on based on it. It the re, the main reservoir is actually white-footed mice. So, and the you know there's three stages of tick. There's the larval stage, the nymph stage, and then the adult stage. So, the larval stage. It's the nymph stage, that's that's mainly spreading Lyme disease, and then the adult, and then the adult. So the so the the larval stage of the tick, which is micro, you know, very very small. You know, they're on white on small mammals. Nymphs, the age ticks, <laughs> they're on raccoons, med tip foxes, typically medium sized animals, and you'll get some mixing. And the adult. Deer, deer, and um, so yeah, so the whole process is the adult stage. Um, never, I'll be honest. You know, I'll be honest with you. You, you know, in Maryland, with our with our climate now, as it gets, you can pick up an adult. of the year. Um, so the best recommendation is check yourself carefully, you know, if you're out working or whatever. Um, just check yourself. If you do get one. But yeah, there's, it's, you know, it's, winter's, winter is a little, you know, probably a little less likely, but, but even in the winter, I mean, And you can, yeah, you can treat your clothes, yeah, with bug spray and all, you mean, yeah, permethrin or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't know about that, so, but, you know, if you're going to be out working, one of the things you can do, you know, is tape, tape your, tape your jean bottoms or your pants bottoms, just wrap, just roll duct tape around one time, that way they can't get up through your, you know, underneath your jeans, and just, just take basic precautions. I'll be honest with you, you know, I'm out a lot and, you know, and, and work all across the state. And I typically don't, you know, take the precautions I probably should. Um, so I, I don't want people to be paranoid, you know, and be afraid to go out and work in their, <laughs> on their property. Just, just check yourself carefully at the end of the day and, you know, and yeah, but it's unfortunate. And right, get the, yeah. My wife, my wife fought Lyme disease about ten, ten years ago. Yeah, she, yeah. It's not fun. I mean, don't don't get me wrong, but, uh, but move on. Jonathan says, got to move on. Uh, we're on slide one. <laughs> All right. What, what time? How much time I got? Nine thirty. All right. We'll shoot for nine thirty. So breeding biology. Um. So, like I said, turkeys breed in the spring, deer deer breed in the fall. You know, they're not out there breeding right now. They're not, you know, it's not when they find a find a nice woman, they they settle down. It's it's two weeks in November, 90% of our deer are bred. Um, and then 220 days later, fawns are born. But but you know, you may see scrapes and rubs on your property. Um, that's how deer are communicating in time, time in their breeding. Um, if you have like a low hanging, you may you may run across like a low hanging branch, and then underneath. It'll be all your way. Something pulled the ground and cleared it all away. Um, and then what that is is deer urinated at bucks and the does both, and their time in figuring out who's where and who's receptive and, and those things. They also rub, um, so they'll rub trees like this to to get you know to get the uh, velvet off their antlers, but then also they're communicating or depositing scent. Um, you got some nice saplings that you're trying to keep around. This is not a good thing. Um, they can do a lot of damage, and if you're in the nursery business, it's a really bad thing. Um, and we have some nurseries in Maryland that that deal with you know with buck damage or orchards um, that deal with rub damage, um, and it can be a pretty serious serious issue. Um, so, like I said, 220 days later, these guys are born. Um, they breed in November. Peak fawning is typically May, early June. Um, they'll average two fawns per doe, typically a yearling. Uh, a yearling, which is a you know about a year old deer, she'll typically have one, um, and then as any older than that, she'll typically have two or even triplets. Um, we do have fawns that will breed. Okay, you know it's, it's a small percentage, but some of the fawns that are born this May and June will actually breed this November. 
Um, mo most of them won't. Most of them will breed the following November, next November, but some will. Um, they have this many, but if you look at our data, only about 0.5 to 1 of them actually make it um, between just natural mortality and predation um, or just a bad mom. Um, <laughs> you know, it typically is about 0.5, yeah. <laughs> it's typically 0.5 to 1. Um, they've done studies that have shown that the older moms are better at raising fawns. Um, and that, yeah, yeah, they've, yeah, they've actually showed that. So, yeah. So, you know, so those older, those older does, you know, they've figured it out. And so that, 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 you know, that success rate goes up as, as they get older. Asterisk. Yeah, so what, what they'll do, it's every 28 days, they, they, they cycle every 28 days. Like I said, the bulk of them, 90% might have been an exaggeration, but 80, 80 or 80 plus percent, will typically breed that first ester cycle in, in early November. If they don't get bred that first ester cycle, they'll come back into estrus 28 days later, and then they'll, they'll be bred by, you know, the second time. Oh, no, 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 no. No, just we yeah, have it's one and done or or none and none and done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean one one time one breeding. So, but yeah, obviously, you know, triplets aren't terribly uncommon anymore. And with 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 fawns. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, no, that's yeah, that that's and yeah, that's pretty common. Um, as a matter of fact, we would check. You know, one of the things we, we don't do it anymore, but when we were back when we were still trying to grow the herd and keeping track of things, that was one of the things we used to check it when we were working check stations was, la was whether the deer was lactating or not. So, uh, yeah, t like the, the bulk of them are born May, June, and they're weaned, say, you know, August. Um, so they can survive at like six, six weeks on their own. So. Um, but yeah, so most most of them by you know by hunting. That's why hunting seasons are set up the way they are. Um, you know, most of them are done. You know, or, or weaned, or can be weaned anyways by by August. Um, sex ratio of the fawns is typically one one to one. Um, at the fawn at at the fawn rate or at at that age, no. You know, it's typically typically. The, at the oh yeah, at the yearling age, yeah, it's much higher. The mortality for for, yeah, for yearling month. No, no, I said just it's it's much higher. So, um, so antlers, you know, if 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 you're a deer hunter or you know deer hunters, it typically is all about antlers, um, and uh, you you can't ignore the lure of the antler. That's why a lot of a lot of a lot of guys are in the woods. Um, it's bone. It's the fast. You know, antlers are probably I think they're the fastest growing bone in, in nature. Um, they typically begin growing in March and they stop growing in September. So they're in velvet um, during during that period. And then come September, testosterone picks up. Um, they there's they harden, they rub that that velvet off and then you got that nice polish what you typically think of as an antler. They drop them in January to March um, and then they start to the process over again next spring and they grow a new set. Um, Use them for fighting during during the breeding season. You know they'll be fighting, sparring back and forth. And they also use them. They can use them for defense. Um, probably doesn't happen a whole lot, but they can also use them for defense. Size of antlers, age, nutrition, and genetics. That's what size of antlers are based on. And age is most important. Um, every year they shed and grow a new set back if they're healthy, and you know, and, and still doing all right. Typically they'll grow a bigger set of antlers. Uh, they they'll have the same characteristics. Um, you know, you can typically tell one year to the next that it's you know it's probably the same deer, um, but they'll they'll typically be a little bigger. Nutrition also plays an important role, obviously, and genetics to a to a lesser degree. Um, I'll talk. We'll talk a little bit about antlers a little later, just just to wrap up. But same management history. We'll zoom right through this as turkeys. Um, Pre-colonial. They were here, Native American tribes used them. We had laws in the books as early as 729, believe it or not, um, with seasons, yeah, and, and, and all. Early, early on is interesting. Uh, some of you are probably aware of how it used to work, but you know, if you broke one of these laws back then, your fine was in pounds of tobacco. That's how you paid your fine in, in tobacco. So it wasn't in, it wasn't in money. 
1800s, just about gone. Um, you know, habitat destruction, over harvest. Um, 1900s to 1960s, restocking. We, we brought deer in from as far away as Michigan, I think, or Minnesota um, in the Midwest. Um, all the states were trading deer back and forth. Um, and, uh, and it was a period of trying to, trying to restore deer and just restore wildlife in general. You know, this is really like the Leopold movement when it got started and people started to recognize maybe we should try to protect the environment a little bit. And, um, and so that 1900s to the 1960s is really a period of, you know, protection. Um, 1918 was when, yeah, it was when the hunting license requirement came back into being. Also, I should touch on this just real quick. So, so this is also, you know, it's, 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 it's gotten a lot better or it's definitely a lot different. Um, but, but you still have a lot of hunters that just like to shoot bucks and like to hunt bucks. And there's, yeah, like I said, it's a lot better than what it was, but there used to be a stigma about shooting females or shooting does. They didn't want to shoot does. It was just all about bucks. And this really got started during this period. Because when we were trying to grow the population back and restore the population, they didn't want to shoot the females because she's the one having the fawns and she's the one that's continuing the population. So, so the early seasons were buck only. You know, you could harvest a buck, but you protected that female. She was the sacred cow. Um, well, we're way past that now, um, you know, and, and all of our seasons and bag limits I'll talk about, you know, we try to encourage the harvest of female deer because we're trying to stabilize and bring down that deer population. But that's this period is really when this when this got started. And, and we're really lucky in Maryland. I mean, most of Maryland is pretty progressive, um, and, you know, and they're not afraid to harvest some females for us. But you get out into Garrett and Allegheny County, they, they still got a little bit of that, that mentality that they don't, they don't want to have. Yeah, they don't want to shoot female deer out there. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so 20s to 70s was, was just like I said, all this restocking and all, and this was when the population was regrowing. They still really weren't a major issue. Deer weren't a major issue at, at, at that time. Um, you haven't figured that out yet. Deer are a major issue. Um, no, Um, it just depends. Yeah, it was it was pretty printed. Well, they did. It, yeah, the palm like the Palmer tranquilizing equipment has been around since the 50s. So yeah, but some of it was just corral and wrestle and and um, and a lot of mortality. Yeah, you know, honestly, uh, a lot of the deer that were trapped and moved, I'm sure. You know, probably. But yeah, we have. We don't trap and move deer anymore. Um, yeah, we get a lot of a lot of people saying, "Why don't you just come trap these damn things and take them somewhere else?" It's like, well, well, where are we going to take them? You know, and we're going to kill eighty percent of them if we if we try to do that. So, but um, yeah, so so the eighties was really when things started to, started to to get it just to you know just cause issues. I guess the deer population, how I should put it, um, because that's when we started to see really exponential growth in that population. We also had some changes, you know, more changes in Maryland um, with develop, suburban you know, development. Um, you know, this was this is all across the state now, obviously. And the problem when you have something like this come in is, is a lot of times it takes hunting out of the equation. You know, and when you take hunting out of the equation, we're the only predators left, really, for deer. They are only effective predators. And then you have all this awesome food-rich habitat out here, all that corn and beans. Um, so that's really what you know, got this population growing. Um, you put it all together, you know, we have great habitat. We have few natural predators. Bears, bears out, you know, this way, we'll take some fawns. Um, coyotes will take some fawns. Coyotes rarely will take an adult deer. Um, and in mild climate, you know, we don't have winter control of deer. My counterparts to the north, they're trying to grow their deer herd when you get up into the, into the, to, uh, the north, to the, New England states and Canada, you know, they lose a lot of their deer every year to winter. If they have a bad winter, they may lose 50, 60, 70% of their deer herd just because of winter. We don't have that here. You know, we may, if we have a real bad winter, we may lose a few fawns, but, but, you know, so you put it all together, you know, and we have just, you know, a good recipe for, for a lot of deer. Um, and, it's, and it's difficult to, to control them. Um, this is our, you know, we do a, a population estimate every year. And you, know, you can see we, we peaked about back about 15 years ago at around, you know, we were pushing 300,000. These are minimum numbers. Um, the trend is actually more important than the actual number, but 
We have went after them hard with seasons and bag limits. We have dropped that population down some. Some areas we haven't. So, you know, I mean, a lot of people tell me you're full of it. You know, I have more deer now than I ever did. But, but if you look across the state as a whole, we have brought the population down some and stabilized it. And um, the last couple of years, we, you know, we have seen, not just, but, but the mid-Atlantic particularly, we have seen a big drop. So, you know, we may be, maybe, I can't say for sure, but we might be bringing those numbers down. So a lot of good deer. Little old Maryland is a pot state, you know, you, know, you had no one deer, deer hunter, you know, and, you know, and going out there. And we have some, uh, you know, we have, and, and Maryland, have all those, you know, those, our, our coastal plains, okay, are some of the best soils in the country for, and then plus all the ag that's grown on those properties. Um, but, you know, we have, we have some really nice deer that come out of those areas and, and it makes deer hunting, you know, really, really popular. Um, popular to the tune that it's, you know, 220, well, it's probably more than that. Fish and Wildlife does this survey every five years. So it should, we should be getting new results here pretty soon. But, you know, in 2011 deer hunting in Maryland, it was $220 million economy. It's, you know, it's, it's a significant amount of a lot of jobs that somehow are related, you know, to, to deer in one way or the other, and a lot of taxes and, and so forth. And from our standpoint, the important part is it, it pays our bill. Um, you know, we we don't get general tax dollars, the Wildlife and Heritage Service. Um, you know, everybody says tax, you know, taxes pay my salary. Well, not really. We don't we don't get funds, tax funds. We operate all off special funds, hunting license sales. Um, you know, is where our money comes from. Robertson, how many of you are familiar with TR funds, excise tax on ammunition, guns, etc. All that money comes back to the states. So that's a huge part, you know, federal rate, that's, that's the federal rate part of that. So, you know, if you add the license sales and the federal rate sales, Nineties, we yeah, when when deer started, uh, when deer really started to take off in numbers and small game kind of dropped off. You know, a lot of the small game pheasants, for instance. Um, you know, that's really when that shift started and that freight train began with deer. Hunting license sales are declining. Every not just in Maryland, but but. But not so bad in the Midwest, but in the East, hunting license sales are declining. We actually peaked, believe it or not, in the late 60s. <laughs> and we're, we sell about half as many licenses now as we did in the, in the 60s. So. Uh, no, it was, it was more about small game and, 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 yeah, access. I think access is a lot of it. And just a, a, why it's declining, it's, it's, it's just a change in society. And, and access is a lot of it. Um, you know, you're not going to be a hunter if you don't have any place to hunt, and it's just really hard to, to get access. So, for you folks that, I mean, we'll, I'll jump ahead for the, you know, you folks that have property, if you don't, and you have deer, and you don't have hunters on it, become a hunter yourself, or let a hunter on to help control deer. Um, but that's 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 a big that's a big issue, um, because deer, you know, hunters are our tool for managing deer, and we're we're losing our hunters. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, archery hunting. Yep, yeah, bow and arrow. Yeah, they. Yep, yeah, they would need. I can talk to you a little bit more after, just to give you details. But yeah, they should. Yeah, they would need a license. So yep. Yeah. There's also some other courses now that, that aren't, they're not geared towards women. They're just called like Deer Hunting 101 and Turkey Hunting 101. Yeah, that, that our outreach focus is normal. Same thing. Look on the website. Look on the web. Yeah. 
Yeah, DNR, yeah, DNR website. Yeah, so there are some classes out there trying to trying to recruit new new hunters. But so long story short, that's the good side of deer. Um, they you know they fund our agency, and then we don't roll that you know ninety five percent back into just deer. I mean, you know, we manage everything with with that money. Um, so you know, game species and non game species alike are managed with that money. So so that's the good side of deer. Um, there, you know, is the bad side of deer. Uh, you know, road kills, crop damage, urban suburban issues, and you know, forest degradation. Hopefully, none of you have a woodlot that looks like that, um, because that's not what you know, that's not what you want, and that's the result of, of too many deer. Um, so that's the bad side of deer. Crop damage, seven and a half million dollars. Probably more than that now. This survey is somewhat dated too, but every year farmers in Maryland lose an estimated seven to ten million dollars. Let's just say. Due to crop damage, thirty thousand plus estimated deer vehicle collisions in Maryland every year. State Farm does that for every state in the, in the country. They project how many across the industry. That's a hundred plus million. If you figure three thousand average, you know, and it's more than that now. So to repair your car, that's you know a hundred million dollars a year just in Maryland because of deer vehicle collisions. Um, and then the you know and the forest landowner damage, you know, from them browsing your your you know your wood lots. It's hard to put a dollar value on that, but it's a big thing. Um, depends on the county. Yeah, it depends on, and yeah, and that was largely orchestrated by the Farm Bureau. Yeah, and um, yeah, there's been legislation in uh, Frederick County and then in Southern Maryland and Charles and St. Mary's County. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so those those counties are, sh are or rifles and shotguns for, for deer hunting. Yeah, Typic typically, right, yeah, I don't want to get bogged this down, but yeah. And need to be more advantageous. Um, range. So, but, but they also, because of that longer range, they can be a little more dangerous if you're in a populated area. So we have, we have counties in Maryland that only allow shotguns to have a little longer range, but it used to, honestly, the technology now. They're in a whole lot. Of, they're in a whole lot of difference. But yeah. So, but long story short, there's counties in Maryland that will allow you to use a rifle for for deer hunting, but then there's counties that will only allow you to use a shotgun. And to help with crop damage, some of these counties that are shotgun only are allowing crop damage permit holders to use a rifle on their own farm. You know, it's not for general hunting purposes. They can use them on their own on their own farm. It would be you enforce it, or it would require so much to try. You need tax maps and who knows what else. That, yeah, it would be tough. Did they do that? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. That would be that would be tough. So, so that's why it's so hard to manage deer, um, or so challenging to manage deer because we have a lot of different interests in deer and a lot of different opinions on how deer should be managed. Um, you know, if you're this guy and I'm one of those guys. Um, you want a lot of deer. You like to hunt. You like to shoot deer. So it's fun to go out and see deer. It's not as fun to go out and sit in the tree and not see any deer day after day. But if you're, you know, if you're him or him or her, you know, you don't want as many deer because they're either eating your profits or they're eating your regeneration or they're, you know, affecting other wildlife that's in the woods. Um, you know, if you're an animal rights sympathizer, you're just, you're just concerned about welfare, and that's that's good. And Lyme disease, if you're a soccer mom, it might be Lyme disease or hitting one with your car or whatever. So, so all these folks have different opinions on how deer should be managed. And, uh, and we got to try to find the middle ground and, and, and make, it, make it work. Um, so, so it's a challenge. Uh, we have a deer management plan to try to, to, try to guide us and, and help. We tend to plan most. I'm going to have to start reading. pretty soon. It outlines the primary uh, number one um, hunters in Maryland. You know, we, you know, typically it's like I said, I think maybe we're bringing that population down. But hunters in Maryland, let's just say they take fifty thousand female deer off year. Um, there's fifty thousand deer that they take last fall. Aren't right now getting ready to pump out. 
one right exactly um, and they paid to do it they bought a license and we got the federal aid money and we're managing all this other stuff now with that money so so they are our number one tool There's no other tool that, that move 50,000 or, or keep 50,000 deer from breeding and becoming 100 plus thousand. Um, but, uh, with the, that goes into our model. Yeah, that, that indirectly goes into our model as a, as a separate mortality. So yeah, that's all factored, factored in. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Um Yeah. And it's hunt for a very I'll talk about that. Um, so along with the regular hunter harvest, crop damage permits also like that we give the farmers are also important. And then we do have some areas, um, you know, in like Howard, Montgomery, some of these counties where you have high populations, we'll have actual, they'll have professional sharpshooters removing deer, you know, not really hunting, you know, it's, it's more deer removal. Um, and then, right, you can't shoot on that, yep, right. Okay, it's it's limited with as far as non-lethal goes. Wide, you know, as far as land scale, um, you can do some non-lethal stuff. Small, I'll talk about that. Um, and then you know, so fencing, repellents, and then I got this kind of sit off to the side here. This this one's not ready for prime time, and probably I don't know if it ever will be from a from a you know, landscape level. But but contraceptives and sterilization. There's actual research into into actually you know birth control for deer. 15 minutes, all right. So it cut me off. So long story short, like I said, uh, you know, the hunter harvest is our number one. to control those females to bring that population down. You see how few females we were taking back here when we were still trying to establish that population and how we switched. My predecessor had no idea that deer would become the problem they are today. Um, I'd, I'd just like to point that out. You know, th this was not the goal um, of, of restocking. You know, I mean, the goal was to put a native species in the landscape where it should have been, um, and you know, with no idea that that the conditions would, the recipe would be for for this. Exactly. Yeah. So. So, you know, if we could get down to, if we could get down to 150 to 175,000 and then reevaluate, and we may need to go lower than that, but, you know, but if we could, you know, if we could see that model get down to around 150 to 175,000, and I'm not convinced we can get there, to be honest with you, but, but if we can, you know, if we can do that at that point, we're going to reevaluate and say, okay, you know, what do we need to do at this point? Do we need to stabilize, you know, do we want to keep it here or is this still too many deer? Do we need to bring it on down? And that's where that compromise comes in because there's a lot of different opinions on there out there how many deer we should have. Yeah. Right. No. Well. Yeah, no, it goes, it goes back to, you know, they are a native species, you know, biodiversity. I mean, they belong here to add, you know, to be a healthy environment, but they shouldn't be here at 30 deer per square mile. They should probably be here at five deer per square mile. They're, it's just, it's just intrin intrinsic value, I guess. So, you know, I mean, that it's a species that, that belongs here that we shouldn't extirpate. Just like a, a just like a darter in a in a stream, why you know why do we care about by, about some darter fish in a stream? I mean, I think it's the same. You know, it's the same. It's the same kind of deal. Yeah. 
Yeah. What value? Cultural. Yeah, it just, yeah. But more importantly, like I said, they pay the bills. So, well, but, but it is in a way. If they, if they just no, no. That if you if you took if you took them out of the if you took them out of the environment, there's a very good chance that that you would not know you took them out of the environment. In fact, there's a lot of benefits to taking them out of the environment. But but you know, but there's also a lot of positives to having them there. And you can't, like I said, you can't ignore the paying the bills part of this. Well, Yeah. So it, right, right. So I, you know, if, if deer would disappear, I think you'd see a lot of other wildlife disappear with it, and stuff and stuff that you may value more um, because you wouldn't have the protection or the funding there to to do it. So, but it's a good question. But I mean, you could say that for any species. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Real quick, Jeff. Yeah. Right. About about fifteen percent button bucks and about I'll talk to you after I'll talk to you after. Let's let's let's, let's keep going and I'll talk to you afterward. Yeah. Um, shouldn't have went with turkeys first. So we are number one in the country for antlers harvest per square mile. No nobody harvests more female deer per square mile than we do in Maryland. Find it deer numbers down yeah so early September yeah the way we get there we're throwing the kitchen sink at them early September January 31st season we have a 30 plus deer bag limit unlimited antlerless bag limit for archery hunters if you're an archery hunter in region B you can hunt, you can take as many antlerless deer as you want everything uh, from Washington County well from from Hancock in Washington Clear Spring in Washington County to the east what's that Yeah, that's right, and that's what, yeah, so that's what he was just asking. So, yeah, the unlimited antler list is for, is for Region B, which is basically Clear Spring East. Yeah, Region B. Region A, which is Garrett and Allegheny in western Washington, we have more conservative bag limits out there because we have deer numbers in, under better control, and we have more, more hunter, and then more hunters and more access. So um, We still have very liberal bag limits in Region A compared to the states around us. Um, even in Region A, you can take five deer a year. Um, so, you know, so, and then with crop damage and all. So, yeah, if you can afford it. Um, yeah, we allow modern muzzleloaders, we allow crossbows, um, trying to, just trying to keep hunters and keep them in the woods, yeah. And then Sunday hunting, you may have heard some about Sunday hunting. Sunday hunting is legislatively controlled, so we, we can't just arbitrarily say you can hunt this Sunday, it has to go through legislation. So that's kind of why it's a mix and depending on what county you're in, but, but trying to keep hunters in the woods. Crop damage permits, I mentioned, are important to farmers. There's the trend in crop damage. You can see we're taking about 8,000 a year now on, on crop damage across the state. And then these other lethal methods, cooperator permits, um, like I said, these are more sharpshooting. And then the managed hunts that you mentioned, Montgomery and Howard County, particularly a little bit in Anne Arundel, they have county, they have deer management staff. They have more deer management staff in each of those counties than we have for the whole state. Um, but they are, they have really taken an active role in deer management in those suburban counties. And, uh, and they do a really good job at hunting the county parks and, and, and the water, the WSSC, the watershed and et cetera. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll talk yeah. Non-lethal, looking at fencing. If you have a small enough area, you can do it, but it's uh, and you're kind of limited. But it, doesn't. it moves your problem somewhere else. You're not solving it somewhere else. And, uh, there are lists of deer resistance. 
get around it or eat it one way or the other. Dogs can be effective. To that do help to keep deer away, not really so. Still more. Is if, if it's a small area, like a fenced government installation, it, it could work. Um, it, 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 you know, you could do it. Landscape, you know, catch a female. Female, <laughs> it's terrible. Have this work. Cooperate with the stuff. Yeah, they get up. We about um, So, what we should have been talking about, let's just talk around. But, so, from your standpoint, deer are pretty easy, just like turkey. You know, food, shelter, and water. Um, but more importantly, keep deer numbers in check. If you have property, chances are you have too many deer on it. I uh, guarantee you, 90% of you in here that have that have problems have too many. Um, the water and shelter part of it's self-explanatory. The food part of it we can talk about then, but you know they're like we talked about earlier. Acorns are important, persimmons, all kind of good stuff. Um, food plots don't cut down a bunch of trees. Put a food plot in for deer. They'll, there's plenty of food out there already. Um, if you have an area that you want to think about managing for deer or turkeys, like I said, clover is a real is a real good example of what to use. Um, I can, we can talk about this, but basically, do your homework and be professional. Don't just go out there and throw learn something that's, that's worthwhile. Um, but like I said, you know, deer are effective for us big. You know, these aren't supposed to look this way. Um, you know, just so you know, a lot, a lot of people in Maryland would think they are that way. This to your woods. That is what's happening, um, and a lot of the damage that that's occurring, and that's why you really need to, to focus on. Yeah, you, know, you do that by this. If you have hunters, or you're a hunter. You can shoot all the bucks you want. And it doesn't make a difference. There's another buck there that will breed those does. You need to shoot or have your hunters shoot. He's the one that's having them. Um, and, oh, yeah, there's limits. Yeah, there's different seasons and back limits and limits. I can talk to you about that. I'm going to stop there. So that's, that's good enough. That's, that's what you need to focus on. So. Right. 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 But if you have a forest management plan, yeah, you can you can get crop damage permits. Yeah. 